Great. Okay, cool. So this is going to be a lot about, um, about you know, putting sessions together, planning them, a uh, different way of maybe approaching training than the way you might do it at the moment. Uh, it was definitely something that the, uh, London, the team I was, I was planning sessions for, changed about uh, the way we, we did our sessions. So our kind of evolution started way back in 2006 and a lot of our sessions were you know just kind of skills based we hadn't been playing any games or anything so it was kind of like okay let's just do these drills and it reminded me a lot uh, about um, when I was with a basketball team you just do these kind of drills which was like layup after layup after layup or shot after shot after shot and it's just kind of like just going through constant repetition and so at the start of um, the start of LRG's progression, that was what a lot of our sessions were. It was like 15 minutes, do this drill, 15 minutes, do that drill, so on and so forth. And over time, um, it, we gained a little bit more like derby smarts, if you will, a little bit more intelligence. Uh, we started to look at what other teams were doing and try and uh, it's like take drill ideas from guest coaches, be a little bit more strategic about the way we planned our session. But there still wasn't really like any kind of, um, there still wasn't any kind of encouragement for developing our brains in a truly active kind of way. Um, a lot of it was, these people are doing this, so let's do that. Um, we weren't really reaching our own conclusions. Uh, and I feel like one of the greatest evolutions that uh, Brawling made was to change that um, mentality of trying to um, emulate what other teams did and come up with our own solutions to problems. And so that in essence is what uh, explorative or exploration training is all about. Um, right, so, um, so I'm going to start really um, by asking you guys a question and feel free to use the chat window. So there's a lot of answers to these to these questions. So feel free to you know just pop in as many answers as you like. But you know what what to you makes Derby interesting? I mean from a from a coaching standpoint, what makes Derby interesting to you? Um, I've got a few few ideas myself, but I'd like to hear from you guys first. So yeah. So I think while, while you guys are typing in your answers, while you find it interesting, uh, one of the reasons I find it interesting is that the rules change often. Um, we're still very early in the evolution of roller derby. Um, and so the rules are constantly changing. Therefore, the strategy constantly changes. And in reaction to the strategy changing, the rules change again. And I find that really interesting, constantly having to relearn you're constantly having to relearn the skills that have worked for you before, which may not work based on the, based on the new rules. I find that I find that particularly interesting. Um, yeah, cool, great, sounds great. Wonderful. Different players with different strengths. Managing that, yeah, that's great. I love that as well. Um, yeah, like I said, the the gameplay changes often, and with that. Um, I find it really interesting that uh, it gives you new challenges. The challenges are always feeling really fresh. Um, and thinking back to that time that I was with that basketball team, uh, training was very much just turn up, run through these drills. Um, whereas with Derby, it's like, it's, every, it's almost every training session can be a new experience you know what i mean so it's unlikely that any two sessions are the same <laughs> i don't know whether that's necessarily a good thing well at least that's the way it was within the london team um in the, in the london team that i was with at the time i was with them so um yeah so i found that particularly interesting okay so we've got Alyssa. i love the aha moments when you jobs and skills click with the skaters yes for sure that is so as a coach that is so rewarding the light, light bulb moment, I, I call that, so good. Um, sorry, I've scrolled the wrong way. Multiple ways of doing the same basic skill transition stops. So it isn't just one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are so many, and I mean, I think that 
that's really hitting at the essence of what explorative training is all about, about uh, understanding that there are so many different uh, solutions to, to those challenges or those uh, problems that we're trying to solve. Um, one of the other things that I really I really love about, about Derby, I feel like it makes it interesting, there's so many moving parts. You know, there's a lot of things going on. There's not many, there's not many sports where you have um, offense and defense being played simultaneously. Um, a lot of a lot of sports like football, basketball, uh, hockey, they're all uh, invasion sports. You have the opposing team's territory. You try and invade their territory and keep making progress until you reach the ultimate goal. As, as it were. Um, so roller derby is definitely not an invasion sport. I, I, I really love how it is. Um, we are all existing here in this space and we both have to try and own this space as much as we can. It's not, it's not anyone's space per se. Like there is no invasion happening. It's just existing on track together. And I really love that. Um, Virginia. The puzzle of the game and how many different ways to get skaters to find answers to the questions being collected on track. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I love it. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I think I think the the last thing that I really love about it is how we're all learning together. And uh, you know, things like derby stance are really good for like that knowledge sharing. Um, how we are discovering it as we go along, and even the people who um, we may consider to be experts are like still relatively young experts, you know, because because the sport is so young for us. Um, yeah, I really love that because there's no long there's no long history of strategy whereby there's been a 20 year period of a dominant strategy or anything like that. It's still very fresh, so the possibility for creating ideas is great. Okay, cool. So uh, with all that in mind um, what is explorative training so explorative training um, is much less about drilling a skill or a strategy it is very much about solving gameplay problems so uh, thinking about what's happening uh, or passages of play that happen on track or something that an opponent might do like it might be researched um, you've researched the way your opponent moves or uh, a strategy or something that you believe the opponent is doing and you use these sessions in order to try and uncover a solution. Uh, so it's less hit the track and do this. It's more hit the track and deal with this and find a solution for it. Um, it's an opportunity for experimentation and discovery, essentially. It's like a, you know, if any of you have ever been in, a brainstorming session they have that uh, that idea in a brainstorming session that there's no bad ideas um, so it, it's kind of similar to that like obviously in derby there are you know, there are plenty of bad ideas because roller skates and stuff could go wrong i mean you think of putting an alligator pin in um so um yeah so think thinking that you know like just use the skill set you have, the brain power you have in order to find a solution to these problems. And once those discoveries are made, then this can be drilled into repetition training. You can start to refine it and make adjustments. I'll go a little bit more into that later on. Um, is everyone with me still? Yeah? Yes? Uh, cool. Is if Does anyone have any questions on any of that yet? Uh, if you have a question, feel free. Use the chat window. I'm going to keep an eye on it. Um, and just try and maybe answer questions as we go along. I'm hoping to be able to have a little bit of time at the end uh, for a Q and A, which I'll like just let you guys ask whatever questions you like. Um, yesterday, I uh, gave Maha a bit of a headache by leaving that really late. <laughs> okay, so the next question that I have for you all um, is: I want us to try and think about. Uh, passages of gameplay, so uh, things that happen throughout a game that you think you might need to find a solution to. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, the the one that I'm thinking of is uh, catching an incoming jammer. So this is something that happens like 
I'd say 100 plus times a game. You have to catch a jammer that is approaching your pack from a distance. You know, every time they come around from a scoring pass, every time there's been a, a recycle uh, and, and you're reforming your wall and the jammer's incoming again. Catching an incoming jammer is a big one. Uh, so I want us to have a think about it and post up your ideas. Like what, um, what passages of gameplay or sequences that occur during games regularly do you think we could work on? Okay. Has anyone, anyone got any? Yes, there we go. Reforming a wall quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Opposing offense during power jams. Yes, yeah, so I like power jam defense. Cool. Switching between O and D. Yeah, that's a great one. It's a great one. A lot of people struggle with that transition between offense and defense. Repeatedly getting offense. Yeah, when you're when you're trying to defend against an offense like all the time. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough. Bridging. Good one. Bridging is critical. Getting capped by offense and how to get out of it. Yep. Again. Okay. Cool. So you've got like a strategy that the opposing team is doing. Um, they're capping you and. Uh, Correct me if I'm I'm wrong here, Bones, but I believe what you're talking about is when the offense comes and sits on top of you uh, and just consumes your space and you're trying to get around it. Uh, reform around a re-catch jammer. Yep, okay. Reforming around offense without letting the jammer out. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool. Wow, you guys are dealing with a lot of offense at the moment, I can tell. <laughs> jammer getting stuck and not being able to get through. Yep, okay. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so we have we have some good situations. I've got a, I've got a few a few more ideas dealing with different types of jammers. Juki versus versus freight train. Yes, dealing with freight train is very difficult. Um, cool. Yeah. So uh, a couple of just throwing out a couple of ideas. Feel free to keep throwing out ideas. Don't take this as a uh, as a time to to stop stop sharing your thoughts. Um, okay, so the list that I've got here, I've got like jam starts is a classic one. Uh, that's very ambiguous, obviously. We can go into more detail about how we want to facilitate that. Um, containing a jammer that's already been caught. I talked about catching a jammer. Um, moments where both jammers are in the pack, with, if you're the front pack and both jammers are in the pack as the rear pack. Um, D to O to D switch, we already talked about that, that transition. Um, rewinding a jammer, recycling a jammer, power jam offense, power jam defense we talked about. Um, the last last 15 seconds of the jam. These are all kind of like uh, ideas. Uh, yeah, okay, power jams, yep, yeah, cool. Playing zone. Uh, you're going to have to clarify that one for me, Shannon. What's, what, do you, what do you mean by playing zone? Is that, um, are you talking about the engagement zone or, oh, playing zone, as in playing zone defense? Is that what you're talking about? Cool, yes, so playing zone defense, yeah, okay, rather than, rather than just doing a strict kind of formation defense, yeah, cool. Um, right, so I feel like playing, playing zone defense is kind of going down the lines of the solution side of it. Um, so, uh, playing zone defense would be your solution to a problem and then therefore something that you drill a little bit more. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, so the, the, the problem would be how do we defend in this situation? Um, and then the solution that you may discover would be, um, play zone defense because, you know, um, we're being offensed a lot. The situation might be that you're you're trying to defend in the face of a two-person offense or something, and you decide that playing zone might actually be the, the best solution for that. And then, having discovered that, you start to drill it and, or start to refine the scenario perhaps a little bit more in order to facilitate drilling um, drilling that zone defense. Okay, so I'm going to pick a um, I'm going to pick one of the topics, uh, we can't, I don't believe we can do polls on the fly. Uh, I would have needed to select uh, all of the options that you guys have put up ahead of time and created the poll that way. But um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, try and pick 
one of the one of the topics that we have talked about. So um, I'm gonna pick. I'm gonna pick reforming around offense without letting the jammer out. I feel like that's one that can have like a lot of variables involved. Um, so I'm gonna type that up in here. Uh, cool. How, how do I clear the whiteboard here? Do I do that? There we go. Perfect. All right. So I'm clearing the whiteboard. I'm just gonna start uh, popping down some ideas. So um, defending while dealing with offense. Okay, cool. All right. So this is a very ambiguous, uh, ambiguous topic. It can, there can be a lot of things involved in uh, defending while dealing with offense. Um, so let's, let's think about um, different variations on this topic. So um, what, uh, one of the questions that I, that I always ask is what, what triggers what triggers this situation? Um, uh, this is a this is a tricky one, but usually there is, uh, say for example, a defense to offense transition. Um, usually there's an event in the game which triggers um, triggers the situation to kick off. Uh, and in the case of defense to offense transitioning, it's usually uh, the jammer has escaped at the front of the pack, and you need to switch to O. Um, not always the case, but let's ha have some uh, let's have some thoughts. Uh, does anyone have any ideas about like what triggers um, what triggers this situation that we find ourselves in? I guess it could be um, they are transitioning from defense to offense. That could be one of them. See, we got we got people typing. Opposing jammer is caught, and their offense is helping them. Yep. Okay. So the jam maybe maybe the jammer's been caught for a for a long time, um, and they've screamed for help, and the offense is on the way. Offense has come back to help them. Our jam has gone to the box, so it's switching from a regular jam into a power jam that we have to defend against. That's a really big one. Okay. Cool. They're recycling our jammer and use the time to send two. Well, that's a really good one. I love that one. I wish more teams would do that. Um, yeah, cool. Those are all really, really good ideas. So those are different ways in which we can explore. So in order to facilitate those, um, what we could do when we do our explorative training is we could set out with our defense of however many people we want that to be, three, four, two, whatever, one. <laughs> Um, and just pop an offense in there and say, okay, here's the offense. Or what we could think about is, okay, let's let's try and facilitate the first one. So the opposing jammer is caught and their offense is helping them. So this means we want to get the defense maybe working the jammer for a little while, or we want the jammer to be a little bit exhausted. Uh, so maybe we facilitate that by getting them to do some burpees before and then jumping onto the back of a de defense uh, and then the offense comes in. Um, the jammer going to the box is a good one. You could have two, two defenses working simultaneously and then randomly send one to the box and then you facilitate the situation. Uh, recycling our jammer and they use the time to send two. Um, that's good. You can have like four people streaming from in front of you at you with two of them going past and two of them playing offense. And you're not exactly sure what to do in that situation. Yeah. So these are definitely like uh, definitely ways in which we could um, we could deal with this. Um, the next question uh, that I have is which players are involved. So this is a pretty straightforward one uh, from our team. I mean, which players are involved from our team and then which players are involved from the opposing team. So the players involved from our team are the players that are playing defense. So thinking about how you regularly uh, set out your, your, your strategy, uh, a lot of teams do 3D 1-0 now, like exclusively one player kind of like playing that all, all the time offense or utility player whereby you've got one eye on the defense, but they're, they're kind of like hitting the offense as much as they can. So thinking about maybe, maybe let's try this with three people. Uh, so three people defending, 
Um, so we're starting to get an idea of how to put together. So three people defending, and let's say we go for, let's say we go for the opposing jammers, um, jammers court, and their offense is helping them. So this means that just one person is coming in for offense, which happens pretty regularly in gameplay now. So what are the, the the people involved from the opposing team is the opposing jammer and a single offensive player. Okay, and so the next question I have. Where, where would these people be located um, when this moment is triggered? So where, where are they physically located, both on the track uh, in relation to each other? Um, and so in this instance, um, on the track, they would be able to be located anywhere. And I think that's a really important thing to think about with regards to uh, explorative training is, um, you might be really good at executing a counter to offense in the funnel, like in the narrowest part of the track, um, and you just drill that over and over and over again. But when it comes to game time and you find yourself on the exit where it's an extra two feet wider, um, you really struggle to execute this strategy that was working so well at training. So, so thinking that in this situation it can be uh, executed, it can be triggered anywhere on the track is a really important um, and the second part I had there, ah, uh, yeah, is where they are in relation to each other. Um, so we would imagine in the instance of defending while, deal while dealing with offense, uh, sorry, I'm going to pop in here, defending while dealing with offense, and then opposing jammer, I'm going to say uh, opposing jammer's gassed, uh, O coming to help. Okay, so that's where we are. So we're defending while dealing with offense. More detailed, we're opposing jammer is gas and the O is coming to help. So we want to think about, uh, um, okay, that O coming to help. Where are we in relation to each other? Where are we in relation to the opposing team? Um, so we would probably be in formation. We would be in some kind of how we do our defense, whatever that is. Like you can start it off in the, the the best looking possible way um, with uh, everyone in the best defensive formation they can be. The opposing jammer gassed on the back of the wall. Now where could the offense be? The offense could be like coming from anywhere essentially. They could be coming from behind, in front, inside, outside. They could smash through the middle. It doesn't yet. Yeah, this is um, one of the nuances that we could do. So we've got a couple of nuances already that are going to change uh, the way this feels, where we are on the track and where the office comes from. So this is going to be really important if we want to truly uh, get to the bottom of this, uh, this problem that we're facing and how to find a solution. We need to be aware of these, these situations. Uh, so um, what, uh, what could these people have been doing right before this happened is the next uh, question. So I guess with this one, um, this is, yeah, this is, this is a little bit of a tricky one to come up with because they were probably just defending some more. Um, the offense may well, uh, be the thing that we can adjust here a little bit more, uh, by changing their position. Uh, the O might be coming from the box. Uh, the O, uh, may be coming from, like I said, the front, the back, the, but essentially the O was probably doing something else, and that's the variable that we can adjust. Maybe they were sitting in the box, maybe they were defending, um, maybe they were bridging, and they've decided to stop bridging, uh, either from in front or behind. Um, that doesn't necessarily change dramatically the makeup of this, but when we are trying to put together a, 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 different, um, a different scenario, what people were doing um, three seconds ago, is a really, really good thing to consider. Um, so I'm going to give you like a, a segue example. If we were doing defense to offense to defense transitioning, there's a couple of ways we could facilitate that. We could have a wall at the back doing defense and then maybe a team bridging out in the front um, and then we start the drill and that bridging team comes back and tries to do um, tries to play their, play their offense uh, from the front. And we can think about this. Now, what were they doing right before that bridging situation happened? 
well, it's probably, if you rewind three seconds, it was probably that maybe one or two of the people were doing the bridging and there was, uh, the jammer was still stuck, albeit with not much space uh, to have to push out before they get out. Um, but they're still probably stuck on the wall right before that trigger happens. And so that's why it's really important to consider like what was happening before the trigger, um, because this helps to uh, embed more of a gameplay kind of a feeling and uh, train in that trigger of like, okay, this has happened. Let's actually try and try and do this thing now. Um, so rather than starting with everyone bridging out and immediately on the jet, on the um, drill start or the iteration commencement that people just come back and start playing offense, you have the jammer having to push that, uh, push those blockers for those last five feet and then they get out. Gassed, sorry, gassed is, uh, it means tired. Sorry, sorry hooks. Gas means tired or exhausted. <laughs> yeah, sorry, something we use all the time uh, in brawling. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, so we could rewind three seconds. In, in this in this case, rewinding three seconds doesn't really afford us much um, much wiggle room for the adjustments, so it's not necessarily a big consideration. Okay, so one of the things that uh, when you're putting these kind of explorative training drills together, um, just be mindful that. Um, we we want to we want to see a certain thing like we want to see a scenario playing out. So if you try and facilitate a scenario and you're looking at it and you're like, this isn't really the situation that that uh, I would. This isn't creating the problem I was hoping to solve. So we need to try and make um, make an adjustment. We need to try and make some kind of change. We need to uh, let's say in this situation we were having a real trouble with. Uh, with dealing with the offense when the offense comes at speed from the inside, um, but we've been drilling it on the um, we've been drilling it on the straightaway, and they're just not able to get that kind of momentum that we've been dealing with in games. Uh, so let's let's move it to the entry to the turn, um, change the angle a little bit so they've got that kind of like curvature of the track where they can really come in and hit us with that kind of pace. So we need to make those kind of adjustments in order to see what we want to see to facilitate the problem that we want to create. So that's kind of an important thing. And just be aware of all of the ways that that adjustment can change the training experience, change the, the, the solution uh, problem. Um, and also consider, consider like adding in things that you want the players to do, like adding uh, variables uh, such as saying to the players, we're going to be defending in this corner, but I want us to absolutely communicate. Like the, the, one of the one of the critical things that we want to we want to try and develop as a skill is communicate. So not only are we trying to find a solution, but we're trying to communicate at the same time. The, the problem that we're facing is that we are not only not dealing with this problem, but that we are not communicating to each other. So adding in the need need for that as well into the drill. Um, or if you feel like you want to up the complexity, having to move from point A to point B and then execute it. So this is kind of thinking about like what's happening three to five seconds before and then, um, and then moving to execute it in that way. Okay, so now we have a subject. How do we structure this kind of session? I think I've kind of like been segueing into that a little bit. Um, uh, but I guess, and I, I hope that this has kind of uh, come across in what we've been talking about, I guess that um, you appreciate that you need to be reactive. Um, this is not the kind of session where you go, where you read off a, a sheet and go, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do this session. It's, it's very open and therefore uh, paying close attention to what the, the players are doing on track, close attention to the way uh, you're adding variables has adjusted the, the training experience for the players is really important. Um, and being reactive to that um, on the fly without having a, a hymn sheet which you're singing off of the training session 
is really important and in my experience is how you get the best out of these kind of sessions. Um, so in order to in order to be reactive, um, I feel like the 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 best way to think about it is to go into these sessions and not have answers. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but um, more thinking about um, how do I as a coach facilitate idea generation and discovery in the players. I'm not here to say this is the problem, this is the solution, let's work it out. It's much more about like this is the problem, I'm going to put you guys in this situation and you know all bets are off. Do whatever you feel like is uh, right, obviously within the realms of the, the rules of the game. Um, do whatever you feel like is going to provide you with the solution to this problem. Um, and so as a coach at the beginning of the session or at the beginning of any of these kind of like sequences, I feel like it's really important to uh, maybe sometimes spell out what the ultimate goal is, um, what you're trying to achieve out of this. Uh, and so in the, in the situation that we've got here, defending while dealing with offense, um, the opposing jam is gassed and the O is coming to help. Um, we could obviously do this infinitely. Um, or we could, uh, because you know, if you if the jam is gassed and you're able to defend against the offense, the jam never gets out. You could essentially do that infinitely, but obviously that's not how the game works. So um, thinking about what the goal is, the goal is to hold the jammer for as long as possible without the offense uh, being effective, essentially. So just holding the jammer for as long as possible. That's that's the goal. Um, uh, whether whether or not the offense is effective or not is um, his point is yeah, that's regardless of that. Um, if, if we if the O is playing a really great O and the jam is still not getting out, you've achieved your goal as a defense. You, know, you should probably have a chat with the jam about what the hell's going on with them. Um, but yeah, so like ultimately, you can simplify that goal. We're holding the jam for as long as possible. Um, now there can be moments uh, where the drill ends. Obviously, if you've held the jammer for two minutes, that is absolutely theoretically the longest that you would ever need to do this. Um, if the jammer gets hugely rewound, because we don't have in these situations um, rewinding and putting people off the track and cutting track can be a real uh, add a level of complexity here for for this kind of thing. Uh, so let's say you just go short rewinds back on the track and then, and then go again. Um, if the jammer gets out, obviously that's the end started again. And so all of those things uh, help to, to shape the, the way it kind of works. Um, I definitely segued there for a moment, so I'm going to try and get back on track. Um, yes, like I said, be prepared to not have the answers. Facilitate idea generation and discovery. Um, and the way, the way I feel like that really works best is to have decent chunks of time uh, in which um, the experimentation is allowed to happen. Um, so the way we would structure it is there'd be like a 15 minute chunk, here's the scenario, here's what you're trying to achieve, here is the conditions for restarting the scenario, so restarting the iteration, in this instance the jammer gets out, um, restart the iteration. Uh, and then you just let the players do their thing for 15 minutes. Obviously, you're observing probably in this instance a number of different groups who are, uh, are doing different things, um, but they're all like trying to trying to achieve the same goal, just coming up with whatever solutions they come up with themselves. Uh, so 15 minutes, and in that 15 minutes, um, you want them to have uh, very short, sharp uh, communications. Uh, in, the, in that 15 minutes, try and avoid the groups coming away and having lengthy discussions because the idea is that they will have another chance, another chance to, to repeat that drill. So 15 minutes period of experimentation and then uh, a five minute period of lengthy discussion. So um, and five minutes doesn't sound like a lot of time, but if you're working with like a two-hour training session, five minutes is a long time to be standing around talking. 
and bodies cool down, etc. Um, and so as a coach, it's really important to try and keep those timings uh, kind of strict. Um, but that five minutes is a chance for all of the different groups to come together, talk about uh, either the challenges that they faced, the solutions maybe that they had, um, and uh, maybe collaborate with the other groups about things that they can try and in that way you get different ideas shared around uh, people can think about the, the solutions that they're using and then uh, and then you know put them together so you know using our example defending while dealing with offense uh, one of the groups might come in and say you know what we just popped someone out of the wall and we like played that offense stopped to a like cut down to a two wall uh, Two people tried to stick together, and one person just played zone and then tried to play against the offense. And then the other groups might go, "Well, that's a that's a great idea. Let's let's try and do that." One of the other groups might say, "Well, what we tried to do is we tried to like um, just swamp the jammer and crowd them to an edge. And then when the offense came in, you know, if they put us off, put us off the track, they put their jammer off the track as well. So, there, like I said, there might be different solutions for the same problem. Um, and coming together. Oh. Hooks, Hooks needs help. <laughs> Hooks, what what help do you need? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, rule 56 is on it. Um, yeah, so like I said, you come together and people may have discovered different solutions to, to the problem. Um, and it helps to spark the ideas. So that, fifth, that five minute uh, quick discussion and then back out onto the track in your groups, 15 minutes to uh, like repeating that again and trying to work on um, making those making those changes. So yeah, so I think one of the things that I really find is that um, especially when your players start uh, start really developing that, that brain power, um, they have a tendency to really want to stop and talk about it um, during during that 15 minute chunk. If that's happening and you feel like you can get it done in 10 minutes effectively, go for 10 minutes because you kind of don't want to discourage uh, that discussion, but you also want to make sure that they, they, they try and think of stuff on the fly as if they would in a, in a game situation. In a game situation, um, you can't just step off the track and go, wait a minute, I need a moment to try and work this problem out. You need to be able to think of things on the fly. So kind of like helps with that as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions at the moment? I'm gonna, uh, just, just make sure everyone's still kind of like following me. Uh, I have a tendency to talk a lot. All right, cool. I don't see any hands raised. so. Um, I'm just going to carry on. Uh, I'm very mindful of time. I feel like I'm doing better with time today. Uh, so there's a couple of like consider uh, considerations and challenges uh, that I that I personally faced a lot with with coaching these kind of sessions. Um, one of the things that can really happen in these kind of uh, explorative sessions is that. Um, it can it can it can very easily go down a route of only benefiting a subset of players, if that makes sense. So in this situation, we could we could very much um, be saying this is just for the defense, and it is. This that ultimately this is for the defense. But one of the things that's really important is to try and make sure that everyone is getting something out of it. So it's it's very easy uh, with the scenario that we've got here to um, to say to the offense, you know what, you're gonna you're gonna try and practice your offense during this situation, um, or saying to the jammer, you know, you're gonna try and practice your your taking the offense in this situation. But uh, in other situations, I'm trying to think of an example. In other scenarios, it you can fall down a bit of a rabbit hole of some of the people participating just kind of like going through the motions, you know, not really, not really doing. Not really doing what the, not really getting anything out of the training session. I think that's one of the key things for me is tr try and make sure that even if the the, the players and those players are not the focus of the drill, that they still have something that they can take from from the, the session or from the from the drill. Um, 
Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, one of the things that I found particularly challenging was uh, I had to learn to provide less direction on solutions. Um, so like I'd have plenty of ideas on how to solve it. And while I would sometimes chime in with uh, those ideas, I would still try my hardest in order to uh, leave the, uh, the solution generation up to the players. Um, um, the other thing that I feel like is, is really important is if you have an assistant coach, which is something that the assistant coach I had at the time was really good at, was when you have those discussions, try and collate those ideas, get them down, get them written down if you can, or video those discussions, anything, because because there's no hymn sheet that you're singing off, it can be very difficult retroactively to recall all of the things that were discussed. Um, and we had we had brilliant ideas that got lost into the murk of explorative training that we only recalled uh, months down the line, and we're like, oh man, I wish we had a I wish we had a written that down at the time because now we would have had months of training it. Um, so I feel like if you're going to do explorative training, really think about like making sure you get those ideas recorded, um, no matter how ridiculous they may seem at the time. Um, and the other thing is try and make sure to keep uh, keep the players on on task, uh, keep them focused on what the what the problem is that you're trying to solve. Um, one of the kind of red flags for me is um, when people are discussing about their experience. Um, oh, bones! The offensive player in general. So essentially, they're working just as hard physically and mentally. Yeah, absolutely. I think in the in the example that we've provided, um, yes, they are definitely they are definitely working just as hard. And it's very easy uh, for you to say offense go all out. Um, but there are situations where um, because something that you want to explore is something that is really messing with you, that you you get absolutely no chance to actually practice it because whatever the opposing players are doing are just completely blowing you up. So um, in those situations, uh, historically, like five to 10 years ago, I would have said, hey, offense, go 75%, but I have learned to hate telling anyone to go anything less than 100%. If you have um, the opportunity to uh, impose limitations on the offense that is not saying try uh, try less hard. Um, uh, pose limitations on the offense, like uh, say, I only want you to play offense on uh, the first line of defense, no playing offense on the brace, or only playing offense on the brace, or I want you, I want you um, uh, to only try and play offense with your hip, you know, any of those kind of things are going to let that, um, <laughs> thanks for the, yeah, try and impose limitations on what the offense can do, which means that they still have to give 100% effort, but they are only allowed to give 100% effort in a way that will help to facilitate, uh, facilitate that. Okay, gotcha, no problem. Um, so, uh, so essentially, um, yeah, they're just working, working within parameters that you set out for them. Um, so, so yeah, so what we, sorry, I, I sidetracked there for Bones's question, but hopefully that makes sense. Um, so during, during the session, try and keep people on task and on topic was, was what I was just talking about. Um, and um, it can e easily like kind of go down a rabbit hole whereby defending while dealing with offense can go a couple of different ways. Either um, the offense, um, the offense um, players can uh, start talking a lot about their experience, uh, about what what they're doing that has success or what they're doing that is 
that is causing them problems. Um, and so while this can be really constructive stuff, it's really important to kind of like compartmentalize that and keep people on, uh, keep people focused and say, hey, you know, what we're trying to focus on is how to counter the offense rather than um, how the offense can do a better job of it. And so that's, that can be a tricky thing to kind of measure, but it's really important to keep people, keep people on track. Um, the other thing that can happen, and if you, um, the other thing that can happen is you have dominant voices, like the same people talking all the time. Uh, and for me, one of the one of the best things about explorative training is getting everyone talking. So as much as you can, don't try and silence the dominant voices, but try and give volume to those voices that perhaps um, are not so dominant. Uh, encourage people, like if if uh, if player J does not actually seem to speak up ever in these discussions as a coach, maybe make a point of saying, player J, you know, like what, 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 is, what, are, you, what are your discussions? What are you finding is happening? Um, and just kind of try and get people talking and thinking um, because if you, I feel, I'm, personally, I feel like if you don't hear from players, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, you, uh, the more they talk, the more you understand what's going on in their head. And as their coach, that's a very useful, useful tool to have. Okay, so that's, um, they're kind of like a bunch of the considerations to think about. Um, I just wanna like talk about now the, the benefits of explorative training. Um, so one of the things that I've probably said a lot recently is, um, developing the derby brain, encouraging critical thinking and analysis. Um, I think this is really, really useful. Um, and it helps to um, encourage a culture in which the players can solve problems themselves. And this helps to alleviate the, the pressure off the coaching staff. Um, and it makes your job more about uh, facilitating that intelligence. Uh, uh, rather than rather than always being the person that has to have the solution, that can be very exhausting. Um, and you'll find that when you work with the team, there's a lot of really intelligent people on that team, and you really want to leverage that intelligence. Um, yeah, so I feel like that is the the biggest biggest takeaway from it. Um, the Next one is that it helps you to develop multiple solutions to one problem. Like I said about the, the offense coming back, uh, you could have the pop someone out to go play on that offense and go to a two wall, or you could say, have wrap, wrap to an edge and uh, you just try and put the jammer off the track, like put a little bit more of gusto into putting the jammer off the track. Um, multiple solutions to the same problem so that when, in this instance, for example, when the offense comes at you in a certain way, you can be like, well, when they come at it this way, we have solution A. Uh, and when they come at us in this way, we have solution B. And we have a number of different ways of handling that. So if during a game you're saying, okay, like we drilled this, we drilled this strategy that we discovered at explorative training, uh, but it's not working. Let's let's try and switch to this other strategy that we discovered during that during that session as well, and hopefully that'll that'll give us the results we're after. Um, and the other thing that I found very very useful is it helped me as a coach make discoveries about my players, about the way the players thought, about their their um, the way they made decisions, uh, how quickly they were able to make decisions, the way they looked at the game. Um, I feel like that was that was very illuminating for me as a coach. Um, the uh, one of the other benefits is you get buy-in from the players. So rather than uh, the players executing strategies that they've been told to execute, uh, they are part of the creation of those strategies. And uh, when they hit the track, they believe in them. They buy into them. They buy into them because they were the ones that came up with it, essentially. Um, and the, the last, and for me, the most uh, important thing is it maintains the hourglass decision-making structure. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just draw up a little diagram here really quickly. Oh wait, I can do shapes. Let's see if we have the right shape. No, we do not have the right shape. Okay, I'll do a line. Um, 
Okay, so um, in a lot of decision making structures, kind of like work like this, you have uh, the coach at the top, uh, and then you have the players at the bottom who execute. So coaches up here, and then the players are down here. Um, players are down here. That's kind of like the decision making with um, with this explorative training style. Um, it creates kind of more of an hourglass figure whereby at the top you have the explorative training and at the bottom you have the gameplay moments um, so that um, you have a little bit more of the coaches here in the middle and then you have the players up here making the decisions at explorative training sessions and then the players down here executing those plays during games. And I really like this because it helps um, everyone comes up with a whole bunch of ideas and that's the ultimate decision making. Like at the top here is the ultimate decision making. We disseminate that down into a point whereby the coach says, hey, this is, remember those things that we worked on at training, this is what we want to execute and then the players execute that at the bottom. So um, for me, that was what I really loved about uh, explorative training is it helped to develop this kind of like hourglass decision-making structure rather than the top-down decision-making structure which I was not and I'm still not a, a huge fan of. Okay, so that is essentially um, the, the, the crux of the way in which uh, brawling and, and uh, the knights of discomfort uh, did their explorative uh, explorative training um, and it really helped us to develop a whole bunch of really cool ideas and really cool new strategies and really moved us away from uh, copycatting what other teams were doing uh, and moved us into a team that uh, teams copycatted us um, which yeah which was really really cool and it and it helped us to kind of like stay at the cutting edge of of strategy and stuff like that, which, which I really loved. I really loved all those things that we were talking about at the beginning about how gameplay is constantly changing. Um, we were uh, part of the ones that really helped that gameplay to continue changing. So um, we have three minutes. <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to throw it to a Q&A now. Question mode is enabled. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions about any of this content, or really about anything, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them now. Okay, someone's typing. So, yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Great question. So, uh, how frequently would you do? So, ah, oh, there we go. Thanks for that. How frequently would you do exploration training? Yeah, it's a really good question. So there would be a lot of um, exploration training that would happen um, at key points throughout the season. Really, at the beginning of at the beginning of the year, a lot of our stuff was skating skills based uh, to try and up the skating skill level of the team. And then there would come a point where we would uh, visit the uh, major gameplay challenges that we had the previous season specifically at the, the postseason, like uh, the at playoffs and champs. And then we would try and uh, deal with those situations. And if you think about that as like your season having various milestones, for example, playoffs and champs is a big one, or playoffs is a big one because you have an opportunity between playoffs and champs to uh, do this kind of stuff. Um, or if there was like another big tournament or a tour that you were going on in the middle of the year, um, after that tournament, you would think about the areas of gameplay that you really wanted to try and focus on. After that, you would do the explorative training. And then that would go for, I don't know, let's say let's say there was like a two month gap between that tournament and uh, and the um, and and playoffs. You would probably spend maybe three, four weeks doing the exploration stuff maybe two, three weeks doing the exploration stuff, and then the rest of that time really trying to drill uh, those things that you found. Alternatively, what you could do is you could um, do exploration and repetition in cycles. So just focusing on one aspect, say you had a list of four things that you wanted to fix, focusing on one, exploring that, then repeating 
doing repetition drills and that, uh, then the next thing exploring that repeti repetition drills and that. But ultimately, the closer you get to um, to that next tournament or playoffs, you would start doing repetition training sessions, whereby uh, you could probably cram all four of those things that you explored into the one training session. So does that uh, does that answer your question? Hopefully that does. Does yeah, cool, cool. Uh, are there any other questions? Anyone have anything else for me? All right. Well, we're at we're at six o'clock. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Uh, um, hopefully, hopefully uh, I didn't waffle too much and you took something away from this session. Um, I believe it's going to be available fifty six after the fact. Thank you very much for the fifty six. Uh, cool. That's that's it for me. See you later, guys. Thanks very much for training in, training, uh, tuning in, uh, and uh, good luck with your explorative training. Bye.